My guest today is one among the ranks of a new breed of female contra bass players, well versed with virtuoso talent, intelligence, and beauty, taking the music industry by a storm. India Owens, the Michigan native and soon to be Juilliard graduate, is preparing to launch her solo recording project. So stay tuned and see and hear India Owens here first on the Indie Beat. The Indie Beat Live in Concert Series proudly presents Contrabass Violinist Master, India Owens.
Indea, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for stopping by the Indie Beat. Thank you. <laughs> the bass of all instruments, the bass. Yes. Uh, let's say I'm the parent and I come to you and I have the most petite five-year-old and he or she is enamored with the bass and they want to play the bass. They just want to play the bass. But do I tell them no? Do I discourage them, move them away from playing the bass because the instrument is too big? What? Well, the bass comes in all shapes and sizes, so you should never discourage someone to play the bass. And there are basses that are half of this size. Get out of here. Yes, yes. What? so anybody can play the bass, but what takes a true bass player to develop is just the fingers because these are metal strings. Surviving so. the callous stage. Yes. 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 So it's a lot of dedication. You have to be consistent. You have to really want to play this. How did you survive the callous uh, phase <laughs> of learning this? How did you survive it? Well, it was a long road. Um, a long time ago, my fingers would turn purple and blisters, and sometimes they would break on the strings, and you know, you sweat a lot. So it, <laughs> it was a long journey. OK, OK. So. Now, do you play another instrument? Yes, I play, well, I started on violin, I play piano, and I play electric bass. Okay, okay. So, at what point in your development did the bass kind of come into play here? Well, I started in high school when I was 15. Um, I actually wanted to be a violin player. That's all I ever wanted to do. But one day, my orchestra instructor heard me playing the bass, and he realized I could play by ear because I was playing all the orchestra parts. Mm. So, but there wasn't a bass teacher, so I had to teach myself how to play. Okay, <laughs> so are you perfect pitch, or did you just have good I relative? just had good ears. Just good from, relative. From playing in church, I just knew where the notes were. Okay. And how it felt. Okay, so now a bass. Let's talk about the structure of the instrument itself. This, um, first of all, the, the open strings are what? Where do you start in teaching someone the bass? What's the first lesson? What's your first lesson to teach them the open strings? Well, first you have to teach someone how to hold the bass mm -hmm. because a lot of people hold the bass like this. They're Ooh. right behind it. Uh huh. Well, which side do you stand on? Now, is that based on if you're left handed or right handed? No, all bass players that I know of stand on this side, on the really? right side of the bass. And you have to have it positioned right here okay. near your groin. And just where you put the hand, you always have your hand right here with your wrist very relaxed. Okay. But I see a lot of bass players play up here. Okay. And you can't get a good sound. Here you can't really get a sound. You okay. hear that difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's just technique. You always play at the bottom of the fingerboard. Okay. Bowing, do you find it drastically different from you know, when you're plucking? Yes, with with the bow, you really want to play legato. Most most classical bass players play legato, just really thinking about connecting the notes. When you play pizzicato, mm -hmm. you hear a little separation. Mm -hmm. So you can't really notice connecting the notes all the time, but with the bow, it's very gentle and very legato. Okay, you have taught your student how to hold the instrument. Where do you go from there? Okay. Which strings are rich? We just want to begin with the string placement. You have your E string, which is the lowest, mm -hmm. your A, your D, and your G. So what my bass teacher, Rodney Whitaker, what he taught me is to just get comfortable playing. Just do that to a metronome, just so you can get your fingers used to being calloused. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then after that, you go to your scales, like, how, how much do your fingers move when you play each note? Because some bass players, they take their hand away okay. a lot. Okay, cool. Now, let, now I've always wondered, now this is basically fretless, yeah? Yes. So, it's, it being fretless, how do you judge, this is your open string, your lowest is? E is the lowest. E is the lowest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you want to find your F on there, 
and move from your F to your G, how do you measure the dis calculate the distance? Wow, well, fingering plays a big role in this. So if I were to play an F on the E string, I know it's right here, it's my first finger. The G is on the fourth finger. Now if I play- Wow, that far away. G on the third finger is gonna go out of tune. So fingering is very important for any string instrument. Oh, okay. Now, you've been working on your own project? Yes. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your project. Well, my project is called Rebirth. So what was your apprehension about moving to New York? Well, it was just the lack of confidence I had. I prayed a long time before I moved to New York, and it was just the thought of, can I make it? Will, will people like my music? Am I a strong enough bass player, a strong enough person 
to last in New York. That's interesting because you're from uh, Detroit. Now, I want to ask you, uh, when we think about Detroit, Michigan, we think about, obviously, the Motown sound. Yes. Uh, but, obviously, Detroit is doing something really right uh, because there is a wealth of talent that has come out of Detroit. Yes. Uh, jazz heavyweights. You have Marcus Belgrave. Yes. Uh, you have uh, the Kennys, Kenny Burrell, Kenny Car uh, Kenny. Uh, Garrett, uh -huh. uh, you have, let's see, who else, who else, Barry Harris, and mm -hmm. Barry Harris is still rolling, and Jones um, Brothers, the, the Jones, exactly, uh -huh. uh, and you have, let's see, who else, Betty B. Bob Carter, yes, were these people a big influence in your early development? Yes, um, actually, Marcus Belgrave was one of my first mentors, okay, and he, <laughs> he saw me at my high school in Detroit. I went to the Detroit School of Arts and I was reluctant to play jazz because it was so hard. I was used to <laughs> relaxed classical music, but he would drive in front of my house. Playing those whole notes, huh? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Adagio for strings, 152 okay. rest. <laughs> but um, he, he was so persistent in seeing me through and he saw the potential in me. I didn't awesome. really see it. Good, good. And I was the student who didn't want to practice. Mm. It was hard to teach me, but he did, so he, he was a big inspiration in my life, and Rodney Whitaker, uh, Marion Hayden, who's also a bass player. Oh, a lot okay. Of people. I'm going to mention uh, a few names, and I'd like for you to tell me uh, what comes to your mind about these players. That is, tell me what have you taken from these masters, and or what would you like to take from them? Charles Mingus. Individuality. He's my favorite. Okay. Victor Wooten. Um, agility. Percy Heath. Agility as well. <laughs> Ron Carter. Intonation. Okay. Okay. Technique. Technique, intonation. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a tremendous focus now on female bass players. Now, yes. I don't know if that's because of the um, popularity that Esperanza has brought to the um, instrument, to the genre of jazz. Has it always been there? Have the players, the female players, always been there? Or is this kind of like sort of a new kind of energy? It seems like it's slowly developing where more women are represented. But when I was playing bass, it just seemed that there was a working bass player every 10 years. Mm. Like you have Kim, Kim Clark here, you have Mimi Jones, you have Marion Hayden, you have Nick West. Mm -hmm. But people around my, my age group, I, I don't know. I don't know of that many. It's, it's about three or four other bass players that are around my age that I know here, and the other ones are out of state. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you're teaching at Jazz at Lincoln Center? Yes, okay. the Jazz for Young People program. How did that come about? Well, someone from Jazz for Young People saw me teaching at Fordham University. I had to teach a business class, music, music 101, what is the blues? and everything, and then they recruited me for that program. Oh, nice. So are you the only musician in your family? Yes. Okay. Okay. Are your parents supportive? Yes. Well, my mom wanted me to be a lawyer <laughs> at first, but I was so good at music, she, she just said okay. <laughs> okay. All right. How many of these do you own? Well, I only own one of these, and I have two electric basses. Okay. Electric bass. Do you enjoy playing it as much as you do the upright? Yes, I love both. Um, each instrument extracts like a certain feeling from myself. With the electric bass, I play my R&B and my gospel because that's what I grew up with. So it's, it's a feeling like at home. But with the upright bass, you have to put so much of yourself mm -hmm. into the instrument because it's so physically demanding. Mm -hmm. It's emotionally demanding. So it's a different, it's a different energy okay. to each instrument. So I heard you say gospel. Will your project uh, contain gospel? Yes. Speaking of physicality, how <laughs> in the world do you get this around town? Well, I had the bright idea of selling my car <laughs> before I moved to New York. What? You sold your car? <laughs> yes, I did. So I take the subway every day. Um, I live on a third floor walk-up apartment. And... I oh, just do it. MG. I do it every day. Oh my goodness. You have to be kidding me. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is that's amazing. 
Well, you are really, really, you're very, very talented, and I'm looking forward to just hearing more and more about you and uh, your work and your project and the Indie Beat. You represent everything that we want to do here in terms of promoting young, uh, nurtured talent. We yeah. just, you know, want to get behind it and, you know, boost it and breathe life into it. We're really looking forward to keeping up with you and following your works. And speaking of such, where can we find you online? How can our viewing audience follow you? Well, you can find me on indiaowens.com or india underscore owens on base on Instagram or just india owens on Facebook. Okay, so be sure to follow india owens online and follow the indie beat online at Facebook. Remember, all things in time, so keep the beat. Okay, so you came prepared today. You came really prepared. Uh, you bought your gunslingers with you. <laughs> yeah, so who did you bring along with you today? Who's well, accompanying you? I brought Camille Gaynor-Jones all the way from Queens, New York. Queens. And, yes. <laughs> and Arco Edis Sandoval all the way from Arizona. All right, yes. all right. Ladies, you're holding it down, representing the ladies. Two thumbs up. Awesome. So uh, you, you, you have projects of your own? Camille has a great project called A Girl from Queens. And Arco Edis has a great quintet called The Sonic Asylum. Oh, okay. So we'll have to look for them online also. Yes. Do you have another song you could play us off air? Yes. Tell me a bedtime story. Once again, India Owens. 